it never really occurred to me that my wife and I would have trouble conceiving. Didn't even cross our minds in the slightest. Having a child was, was the next logical step. I didn't want to accept it at first. I felt like it was my fault. Hello, I'm Sophia Jessica and welcome to the Fan Carpet. Hello, hello. How are you doing? Hi, Mark. Hi, Tom. You alright? I'm good. How are yeah, you? good, thanks. Yeah, yeah, really cool, thanks. Good. Thanks for joining me today. That's all right. No problem. Yeah. All right. Um, so um, if we go back to the beginning, uh, was there a defining moment for you to get into the film industry? Ooh. Um, yeah, I guess I've always loved like being creative and doing stuff like that. And um, so the story I always tell about why I wanted to be a filmmaker was when I was 13 years old, uh, for the first time ever, me and two friends went to the cinema with just us, no parents or anything like that. Um, and we saw Jurassic Park and uh, we walked out, the three of us walked out of that cinema and they were raving about dinosaurs and I was just like, I want to go and make a film. And we literally walked back to my house, got my dad's video camera, went over to the park and started making a short film. Um, so awesome. it, yeah, from that point on, I was just like, that's, that's kind of what I want to do. And I've sort of slowly found my way there over the last sort of 20, 25 years or so. Right. That seems to, um, that seems to be a popular one for people to for people to get into the industry with. Yeah, I think I think people, do, particularly in my generation, it's you know, it's it's one of the the, the biggest movies to come out at a very formative time. Absolutely, it's a great. It still stands up to this day because mm. uh, you can actually yeah, reach out because you can actually reach out and touch those dinosaurs because they actually yeah. made them. It's not all CGI. Um, exactly. Yeah. There's accents, I believe, but not not to the extent of like the the later films like the Jurassic World. Yeah, yeah. And Jurassic World. yeah I, th I think there's something like in the entire movie there's 15 minutes worth of dinosaur footage and only f like five or six of that is got CGI elements to mm. it so yeah yeah it definitely stands up still one of my favorite all-time movies yeah cool that's great um so what prompted you to create your own production company within Snap Dance? Um, well, initially it was uh, myself and my uh, producer Zara, you know, we, we worked together at a, 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 a production company, but we were going to take a bit of a risk making this documentary and it was going to be, you know, like crowdfunded, self-funded, like it was, it was a real sort of independent effort because it was, it was difficult to kind of explain the concept to people. Um, so we thought, you know, let's just form our own little production company that's, that essentially uh, was just to make this movie. Um, you know, but what the future lies, I don't know. But but f f for now, it was literally just to just to make this this uh, make this entity and you know allow us to sort of distribute it and that kind of stuff. Awesome. Um, yeah, it uh, always starts with a little idea, doesn't it? Uh, mm. and it just grows and you never know where it's going to get to yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely um, so what was it about the easy bit that intrigued you to make it so uh it was kind of uh created out of my own experience um my, my wife and i spent sort of best part of a decade trying to have a child um and a lot of that time was spent trying to qualify for fertility treatment um we we had what was classified as unexplained infertility so basically what that meant was uh, we would go and get investigations done medical investigations like my wife had to go through maybe half a dozen invasive procedures and, and that's like pretty nasty stuff and i had to give like semen samples and things like that and they all came back yeah everything's fine we don't understand why you're not getting pregnant naturally but ivf will work for you because you're young and healthy and we were in our mid-20s at that point um we it took us so that was sort of mid 2000s it took us until like 2015 before we we qualified for uh nhs funding uh, and we got given two rounds of fertility treatment on the nhs um and w strangely both of them failed um and and they couldn't explain why 
so we looked at all of our options and it had taken such a huge toll on us that we decided to sort of be childless not by choice that was kind of the route we thought we'd take we didn't really want to pursue adoption or or donors because i mean with with donor stuff it, uh, we didn't know where the issue lies so it's very difficult to to go down that route when you don't really know what the problem is um and all throughout the process of going through the treatment we'd written a, a blog called journey to the far side of the womb and uh each post was basically written from both of our points of view like each paragraph we sort of alternate between what we were going through in those moments and we had some amazing comments and feedback on that and one of the biggest shocks was the fact that most of our readership was women because there's a very strong fertility infertility community for women uh, on social media particularly back back then about five years ago um and they they just were like i had no idea my husband was going through this i had no idea this is what it was like for guys i had no i've never heard a man talk about it in this way and i just felt that there was nothing there for guys there was no like there was no one talking about it and no one explaining what it was like emotionally and, and physically to go through that sort of stuff so that's when the seed of the idea of making the documentary formed when we thought we were going to be childless not by choice uh it, it kind of became a mission that i had to make it because i felt like i couldn't let sort of 10 12 years of this pain be for nothing uh so i wanted to some create something positive out of it and um so I, I started the process of making the film and whilst that was going on my, my wife uh, and I were talking about her having a hysterectomy to sort of draw the line under it and, and move on completely um, but when we went to see a consultant they suggested uh, doing a procedure to do one more investigation and maybe try a few things and try naturally for a couple of months and see if it happened before we did so we could we could really rule out all the what ifs because that's one of the worst things about fertility treatment is you're constantly in these spirals of anxiety of what if, what if, what if, you know. Um, so even though it was an incredibly uh, difficult emotional time, we decided to give that one last shot. Um, and amazingly that we, we got pregnant um, off the back of that. Uh, uh, it's kind of semi-naturally really. Um, and we're we're lucky enough to have a, a nearly four-year-old daughter um so you know all through that process i was just like i have to i have to make this film because i have to get this these these stories out there and normalize it make it make it normal for guys to just talk about stuff like this cool yeah uh congratulations uh it was a hard fought battle you. but you got there so congratulations yeah um, you. yeah so, we're one of the lucky ones yeah there's not always a happy ending uh, no. not always a happy ending at all um so um while filming do you have any memories that will stick with you uh for the rest of your career yeah absolutely i mean uh, all filming all of those interviews uh, is gonna stick with me it was you know we shot them in a very specific way um so uh it's it's men when they're going through struggles like this whether it's infertility or anything else uh it's very unusual for them to seek professional help uh and very unusual to talk openly about it which is why they tend to seek peer-to-peer -peer help so it's that kind of uh stereotypical mates down the pub mm. but because of the because of the impact that fertility is perceived to have on masculinity uh it's a very difficult subject to talk about with your mates like it, it you know you might not want to bring that up um so th i wanted to make the documentary in a way where the the people talking were talking directly to you so it was like you were having a conversation directly with somebody so we set the interviews up by having the guys talk directly into the lens of the camera the only other people in that room, it was quite a small room. There was myself and I was sitting at a 90 degree angle to the men. So not like a normal interview setup where you're sitting just off camera. I was sitting way out of their eye line and my uh, cinematographer was just like 
hiding behind the camera really so the guys didn't really have anyone to look at because I felt that quite often when you're looking someone in the eye that's when you get embarrassed that's when you feel a bit of shame whether you should or not it's it you know it, it, it creates that little barrier so the guys were literally just talking like like directly into a lens of a camera like this mm-hmm. um and it allowed them to just open up and I was shocked at I would just ask a question and it would just pour out of them and there were so many moments through that process that I was just in awe of these guys and how honest they were being and I, I said to them like you're gonna go you have to talk about some stuff that you can stop at any point and I was like and if there's any question they wanted to ask me in return then I would answer and I had all the time to answer that that they wanted and if they wanted to spin a question back to me about my experience and I would absolutely answer that for them and you know I I, I was always very uh willing to tell them that you know in situations like this where I'm I'm on camera I'm happy to talk about my own experiences because you know we need to sort of stand together and make and help normalize everything so yeah it will stick with me because it was it was an incredible experience so with with um, with the with obviously your, your with your own experiences and and speak to the guys uh, did you um tackle it in in a in a way that was like um uh, like thoughtful and and with with as much compassion as possible yeah so i was very aware that uh i was going to be opening some difficult emotional topics for these guys and they were going to have to talk about things that they would find really difficult and you know i'm not a i'm not a trained psychologist and i know that you have to take a lot of care when doing something like that so the way i approached it was i wrote around 75 to 100 questions for each interview and those questions ranged between very clinical uh process-led questions um which were designed to kind of just keep the guys sort of talking about the topic. And then there would be questions that were more about the emotional side of it, which is what the core of the documentary would always be. Um, but it was all about creating a safe space and, and in that room. So there were only three people in that room, including the guy who was on camera. Um, you know, they had complete freedom to leave the room, go for a walk. We had no sort of like time restraints, they could take all day if they wanted to, you know, they, it was, you know, if they wanted to just stop and have a drink or eat or anything like that, they were completely able to do so. Um, and, you know, I, I also allowed that, like if they answered a question, but they felt they hadn't answered it how they wanted to, they could, they could answer it again. Um, and uh, if there was anything that they said that, they felt they didn't want to be made public then we, we would discuss it and and um you know if if it was something that i agreed was, shouldn't be out in the open and wasn't necessary for the film then we wouldn't include it so i wanted to make them understand that you know i had a great deal of empathy and i think them knowing that i'd been through it was was really helpful um because you know when we filmed these interviews i think for for two of the guys it was the first time we'd ever met and in person and for the other four we'd met maybe once before so all right okay so yeah fine. so it is documentary where you want to uh, where you want to stay and further explore as a filmmaker um i would definitely like to do more documentary filmmaking um i i i'd really like to uh create narrative features as well so i think have, having done one documentary i might try and pursue a, a narrative feature next um and see if that pans out and i mean it's incredibly hard to get something like that off the ground in the best of times but even now with with covid it, it makes it even more difficult so um you know i'm sort of keeping my options open but i would like to do both uh, uh, ideally and, and have a career do, doing both do you have a uh, have a preference on on the genre that you'd like to tackle or is the skirt of the limit um i think sci-fi is something that i really enjoy um you know i think i think with sci-fi you can tackle a lot of interesting issues uh and have this kind of great you can have fun visually with it with the genre that way um so that kind of appeals to me uh, a lot and um 
yeah i, I you know any, anything really i think it's all about the the story and the and the, the project and and the people involved and you know there, there may well be a, a genre out there that i i might not particularly participate in as, a, as an audience but suddenly if the right project's there and it looks like it's going to be interesting to do that I'd, I'd, I'd do that so yeah yeah anything really awesome and you can write in masks <laughs> yeah right in the use of masks uh, in a sci-fi yeah um, absolutely yeah yeah um so are there any other aspects of the film industry that you'd like to pursue um no i think i think directing is is where i've kind of where i find myself leaning to um you know i i've i've worked in video production and and stuff for for most of my career so i've i've tried out pretty much most job roles i've uh, you know i'm a, i'm a camera operator i've done lighting i've done audio done post production editing graphics all everything basically color grading you you name it um so i kind of know where my strengths and my weaknesses lie and where i i want to get people who are better at it to do those jobs and you know, I, 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 I think that what I really want to explore now is, is directing and, you know, working with actors and, and just finding and telling interesting stories, really. All right, cool. Uh, good luck with that. Um, so who inspires you in the industry, whether it's a documentary filmmaker or, or, or American? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, obviously, I mentioned Jurassic Park but earlier, so there's a lot of kind of Spielberg movies that uh, I absolutely love. Um, you know, I love I, lo I love things like the the mockumentary genre that uh, Rob Reiner and Christopher Guest sort of pioneered with Spinal Tap and and Best in Show and that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I and I think uh, there are so many great documentaries around. I absolutely uh, adore uh, Asif Kapadi as Senna um and the way he told that story and so there, there, there's a lot of people that uh uh kind of i look up to and and an influenced by i guess and you know i i there's there's just so many great films out there that and 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 you know i, I like to i'm a, a big fan of sort of studying films so going back through film history and, and whether it's silent movies or german expressionism or, or from the 1960s and you know I'm, I'm a big fan of sort of like early 70s movies and yeah so i just like to pull from look at everything really and just enjoy being a fan of movies brilliant so um, is there a book that you're a fan of uh, that hasn't been adapted to film or TV or Netflix yet that you'd love to be a part of? Oh, there's two. There's two. And interestingly, though, I think both would work best as some kind of series as opposed to a feature film. Um, one of them, I think, has been rumoured to have, like, it's been kind of on the back burner in Hollywood for a long time. Uh, and that's a, a sci-fi novel by Arthur C. Clarke called Rendezvous with Rama, um, right. which I th last I heard, I think David Fincher might have had an option on at one point, and and that would be amazing. Like I can absolutely see that. Um, and then there's another book that I like. It's a biography of a guy called Leo Marx, and it's called Between Silk and Cyanide, and it's quite a difficult book to get hold of. But he was a he kind of accidentally found himself as one of the chief uh, code breakers for the SOE during the Second World War, and uh, it's his his autobiography, and it's it's fascinating and really funny and and uh, just an amazing story um, about this guy who was an absolute genius with codes and cracking codes and developing codes and developing ways that the the, the um soe operatives could could conceal them um and uh, there's a lot of political power play with him and all of the different intelligence sections so like that that would make an awesome series i think yeah that would be um and series these days are are shot as though they're a, 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 a giant movie exactly um, yeah. so yeah yeah. Um, yeah yeah there's also a couple of novels by a, an author called uh michael marshall smith who did uh, early on he did some really cool sci-fi novels uh one's called only forward and another one called spares and they're, they're really cool they they, they make uh, good movies awesome 
sounds great. Um, mm. I can see those. Yeah, but I love sci-fi as well. Um, mm. So with the popularity of streaming services like Netflix, uh, what do you think the future of cinema is? It's really hard to tell. I mean, before COVID hit, I was, you know, it looked like cinema would struggle, uh, and now it's it's had a been dealt a massive, massive blow. And you know, I think the next year to two years are going to be really crucial to like in 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 cinema films. Um, you know, I you know i i always knew that the easy bit would be something that people would watch probably on a tablet or a phone or maybe on on their TVs um because it was something that they would want to do privately so i kind of always felt that that's where it would end up and probably be at its most potent um but having said that seeing it at the rain dance film festival on the big screen in in uh, in the view was just like that's that's awesome to to sit and watch that and um you know it's it, there is a definite experience seeing a movie on a big screen like that and i don't know what the answer is going to be but i hope that as an experience doesn't go away and i hope it stays accessible like i think i think it bottom line is it needs to be cheap enough for people to be able to go often and I think it got to the point where it was it was too expensive to make it a regular thing. Um, but the trouble is, if you make it cheaper, how do you make money off it? And if you're restricting the number of people in the buildings, how do you make money off it? So, yeah, it's a real a real chicken and egg like issue. Like you don't know. I I, I can't. I just have no idea how it's going to pan out. Yeah, and, I, and at the moment with cinemas reopening. Uh, they're not doing concessions and that, that's where they make their money. So. Mm. Yeah. So that's obviously, that's another consideration. Mm. Um, yeah. So uh, what are you hoping audience will take away from the easy bit when they get a chance to see it? Well, I think uh, the main focus, like the main audience it was kind of originally designed for was for guys going through it to, for them to hopefully feel not so alone. And I think then in addition to that, their partners understanding what they're going through. And then on top of that, they could share it with friends and family to help kind of them educate them as to what, what the situation was. Um, but what we're also seeing is that a lot of consultants, clinicians and fertility industry people are starting to watch the film and actually realizing that perhaps they can make big changes to the processes uh, and they can do more to support the guys. So I'm hoping that that's, that's going to, to be something that we see happen in the future but you know wider than that i just hope that people uh people understand that they aren't alone uh, and and talking about all of this stuff and any mental health problem is 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 fine yeah absolutely so um and just just before i let you go what are you working on at the moment that we, that we can look out for um, I don't have anything uh, that I can announce or talk about. Uh, I've, I, I'm kind of pursuing a couple of ideas for narrative features as a possibility, but I think, you know, they can be a bit of a, a, a long shot, particularly at the moment. But, um, you know, uh, yeah, so I, I, I've got some projects that I'd like to kind of get off the ground and get working on um, and, and maybe start thinking about another documentary. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I'm sure more will happen. But we'll have to see what's happening with COVID first. Mm, absolutely. And um, and where can people find find you and keep up with with everything that you're doing? And the film, uh, of course. Yeah. So we have um, we have social media platforms for the film. Uh, we have Instagram, which is at the Easy Bit. We have Twitter, which is at the Easy Bit Doc, and we also have Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash the Easy Bit. Um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram as at Tom Webb Director. So, yeah, awesome. they're, the, they're the main places. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, it's a pleasure. Uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. And um, yeah, um, spend spend as much time as you can with the family that you fought so long and hard for. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> yeah. to Lovely to speak to you. Cheers. You thank too. You. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you for watching The Fan Carpet. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram for more content next time. Uh.
I probably, like most men, didn't want any help, didn't, well, I didn't want it, couldn't accept any help. Probably didn't cope very well with it, just buried it down, I think. I can't think of one aspect of my life that's the same now as it was before the diagnosis. Men are as much part of this as well, why don't we say something? I'm here on the largest of the Balearic Islands, Mallorca. With the turquoise waters of the Mediterranean Sea, beautiful mountainous landscape, the thriving city of Palma, quaint little market towns, a growing number of luxury hotels, it's no surprise that the likes of Audrey Hepburn and Elizabeth Taylor like to holiday here. So come and join me as I take you round Mallorca. Thank you for watching the fan carpet. If you like this video, be sure to click that thumbs up button at the bottom of your screen. And also be sure to subscribe to the fan carpet YouTube channels. They're absolutely free. That's so much fun too. Be sure to check out the official website, thefancarpet.com. Also, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay up to date with reviews, competitions, the latest news, and so much more.